and welcome to Mindset, an HCD vidcast, where we dive into the world of applied consumer neuroscience and market research with leading experts in the field. My name is Michelle Nigella, PhD in Behavioral Neuroscience and Director of Research and Innovation at HCD. And I'm Catherine Ambrose, the Manager of Behavioral and Marketing Sciences with HCD. As your hosts, we are going to act as the buzzkills for the buzzwords, taking time to critically think about the limitations and pitfalls of emerging trends and topics within the field to help you identify what innovation has a lot of untapped potential or is too good to be true. Now, HCD is a full service research house which provides research capabilities on consumers by looking at how they perceive, evaluate, and respond to different types of stimuli, such as looking at product experiences, communications, or just general consumer and shopper experiences. We use a combination of tools that come from psychology, physiology, neuroscience, as well as the traditional methods that people typically use to see how they experience different stimuli. That stimuli can range from the early stages of exploration all the way through the final product validation tests. This is what we refer to as applied consumer neuroscience. So stick around for more curious conversations as we chat our way through the ever evolving space of consumer science. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mindset. We are so happy to have you here. It is Michelle and Catherine back at it again with another Journal Club episode. Uh, It got really well received the last time we did it about the um, Lisa Feldman Barrett paper. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that yet, I recommend going back to take a listen. We even got a response from Lisa Feldman Barrett herself. (laughs) I just want to put that in there. It's very exciting. <laughs> we fangirled just a little. <laughs> um, we'll see if we can get anybody from this paper to respond. Who knows? We'll try tagging them. We'll see. But I think this, you know, this is a fun exercise. It's something we always did in grad school um, and that you do in academia a lot is we get together and we read, it's kind of like book club, right? But as journal club, we, we read a scientific journal article And we discuss it. We discuss what happened. What did they do? What did they find? What did they maybe do wrong? Or what did they interpret wrong? Or what is something we don't understand that perhaps needs further study? And it's just a really fun exercise. And, you know, I think it's a really good thing to do with our listeners and watchers. Absolutely. So also it's really fun for Catherine and I, (laughs) we get to hang out (laughs) and nerd out, right? Yes, exactly. But, um, and one other just housekeeping thing before we hop into it, if you are listening on the podcast, there is a little bit of visuals available for this. So if you want to hop over to YouTube and watch this on YouTube, there are going to be some of the figures that were talked about throughout the, uh, throughout the article that we will be referencing, but, uh, we will do our best to talk through it. Or if you just have the article with you, then, um, you can just refer to the article. So we're just showing imagery from the article itself. Uh, Nothing that we've made up uh, on our own. Um, For example, this first slide is really just the title and the (laughs) the authors and where they're coming from. So this was an article that was in Frontiers in Neuroscience. um, And uh, it was published this year in 2022, if you're listening this year. Uh, So in February of 2022. um, And the title is Sound decisions, the combined role of ambient noise and cognitive regulation on the neurophysiology of food cravings. Now, this is right up my alley. Those of you that have, you know, heard me talk about things before, my background in academia was focused on taste and smell, but specifically drivers of feeding behavior, the behavioral neurogenetics of feeding behavior. And so, you know, this, this sort of information, this sort of research is stuff that I love. Um, And so this research is led by a group of scientists as things typically are, but this is a really interesting one because it involves a group from China as well as a group from uh, Denmark Denmark. as well. Yeah. Which, you know, totally two different sides of the globe, (laughs) always an interesting way to do a study. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. But I believe the study was run in Denmark. It was run on Danish students, but yeah. it was really interesting because 
Uh, the objective of this study overall was really just looking into exploring how background sounds might influence food-related decision-making. And, and they wanted to explore this doing something a little bit more mixed methods, uh, having a bit more of a mixed methods approach. And what that included was using things like biosensors as well as some self-reporting. And again, Which is something we always push for <laughs> right up our alley. Yeah. So <laughs> this was really exciting to be able to take a look at. Uh, it, it was great too, because they did use uh, certain scales that we are familiar with and, and uh, methodologies that we're familiar with, but it was, it was kind of interesting to see certain combinations that we had not seen before. So personally for me, I was a little surprised to see them put together the EEG headset with a GSR or EDA response, which is just your galvanic skin response. So your sweat response. I think that's actually pretty common though. I mean, it's something we talk about doing a lot because it is easy enough to do, right? They're certainly not going to interfere with one another. No. Um, so I think it, you know, if you're measuring GSR, like we typically do off the palm of the hand, that's certainly not going to interfere with the, um, the EEG headset. So I, I say, go for it. You know, if you can add it right in. Yeah. And the, the thing I did want to make note of though, that I thought was interesting and I, um, appreciated the, the recognition of this in the limitations, but what is being the study here is focusing on the visuals because they have these standardized pictures that they used as well as auditory sounds. So it is technically a multimodal approach because it involves two different sensory experiences. However, it is not the exact same thing as being in a restaurant. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about being in a restaurant. Cause I think that is, you know, there's always this huge difference between the real life setting and the experimental lab setting. And, you know, it's something we're always trying to talk about with clients because, you know, they want to get real world sort of insights, but they're doing it in a CLT or a central location testing sort of situation. So the idea of this study, although it's done in a lab and it's in a really confined and controlled space, um, you know, they do have to control things. And so they can't make it totally realistic. But the idea is that you either have a super noisy experience or a super calm and quiet experience. And I thought this was something interesting just to talk about a little bit, because when it comes to sensory marketing, like this is something they talk about a lot. The difference between say going to a fast food restaurant and going to um, you know, a fancy French restaurant. And so the idea, the difference between the two from a sensory marketing standpoint is that the fast food restaurant is all designed to move you through quickly, right? You need to eat this high impact food, which is often, you know, high calorie and, and maybe not the best for you, very high in salt, sugar, fat, right? Um, and the, whereas the, the French restaurant, the high end restaurant is more about, they want you to stay there a very long time. Right. You could be there for hours, you know, maybe more food. <laughs> three hour event. Well, not only might you order more food, but you're probably doing a tasting menu that's coming out, you know, like maybe there's 12 different dishes and it's going to take you three hours to go through. Um, whereas the fast food situation, again, it's like they want to move you out because you paid very little for your food and it's about moving you out the door quicker. So you, they don't want you to stay longer. So it should be kind of like an overstimulating situation, right? Where you actually do want to leave. The seats are hard. The, the noises are loud. The lighting is harsh. Whereas at French restaurant, comfortable chair, soft linens, you know, like nice little background music, soft lighting. Right. Everybody looks lovely because of the soft lighting, things <laughs> like that. But I, I think that that's at least what they talk about in sensory marketing. Um, but given that this story is kind of about how those cues, right, the cues in your environment, the louder music or the softer music um, affect your decision making. So the participants had to decide whether or not it was going to be something they would choose for now or for later, which would be like a, giving them an indication of craving, right? Um, and this I thought this was interesting because the idea would again be that, you know, the loud would be a little more like that fast food situation and the soft would be more like that fancy French restaurant. But Catherine and I have both been to a really nice Michelin star restaurant recently. Um, We're not trying to brag. Wow. <laughs> yeah, not trying to brag or anything, but we happen to live in the Philadelphia area and Philadelphia has the number one best restaurant in the U.S. I feel like we should hold our noses up. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Um, and we've both been to it, which is amazing because you do have to get reservations like way early in advance or, you know, be lucky enough to get a seat at the bar or whatever it might be. But how was your experience with that? Would you say it was the loud kind or the quiet kind? It wasn't McDonald's. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> It was interesting. Uh, it's interesting you bring it up because my experience there was the the food was excellent. Let's start there. It, uh, the place is called Zahav if, if you're in the Philadelphia area and the food was absolutely incredible, but I did make note of the playlist. I was very surprised yeah, because it was loud. It was intense. Yeah. It was really like they had uh, a playlist that included today's top hits and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really expecting to be hearing. It wasn't calm. Songs. No, it was TikTok trend songs. Like I was, I was really surprised. I was like, oh, I, it, and it threw mm -hmm. me off because yeah. I noticed. It's it a little bit distracting. Yeah. yeah. And the, the volume was high yeah. uh, of the, the music itself. But then I think the acoustics of the restaurant itself were also loud. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I was thinking of that, cause like when I was thinking of this study, my first thought was like, oh yeah, that, that thing they always talk about in sensory marketing of the difference between the fancy restaurant that you stay at forever and the fast food restaurant. And that makes total sense. But like when we go and practice and I think, and I started thinking about, well, Zahav, like it was very loud and I was there for, for many hours, mm -hmm. um, at least two, if not more, because again, you do have that fixed menu that just goes on. Right. Right. But, um, even though it was like this loud experience, it, you know, you are meant to stay. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do find it interesting because I think about also our own personal biases with it, that like, we are extra aware of our environments and the context, <laughs> but to further that point, I think that Zahav is actually really interesting too, because it's in the heart of Philadelphia. Yeah. And I think that they really want to bring Mm -hmm. that fact into their, into their restaurant. And, yeah. Yeah. and I think they might be doing that through the music to show that it's a more of an, um, urban, an urban setting because yeah, we're in a modern. city. Yeah. But I think also when you think about the type of food, so it's like middle Eastern, right. Upscale middle Eastern, but a lot of it comes from, you know, some of it's very street food and origin. Right. And so bringing in again, that sort of urban feel, perhaps that lively feel, um, maybe that's all part of it and it is still part of like a sensory marketing schema, but you know, it was just kind of an interesting thing to take into consideration yeah. because the question here in this research paper is, you know, does the ambient noise around you affect your decision-making? And it's a good question because, you know, if you are sitting in a restaurant and if the music is loud, is that going to maybe encourage or discourage you from ordering the dessert you didn't need? <laughs> right. But then I would even push it further and say, is it just sound that's going to affect that? Or, right. you know, I mean, the answer is of course not. Right. Of course not. So it's, it's, are you, you know, if, if again, if I'm at a beachfront property restaurant or whatever, and mm -hmm. they're blaring some hip hop music or something like that, like the, in, in my mind, it doesn't fit. It doesn't match. I'd want to hear some Jack Johnson if I'm on the beach. Whereas I was going to say, are we going to have to be forced to listen to some Jimmy Buffett? <laughs> <laughs> but again, it is, it's keeping in mind that overall context that is going to help influence it. But I do think that having these studies, like the one that we're talking about here, where they really try to isolate particular sensory modalities helps us to get an understanding of the right. overall picture by breaking it. Down. It's still a noisy situation. It's distracting. It could be overstimulating as they kind of talk about in this paper. Mm -hmm. um, so you were talking a little bit about their measures. Um, so it was FAA from the EEG. So frontal alpha symmetry, EDA, galvanic skin response, and a self-report looking at sort of like craving. And they were using, like you were saying, visual analog scales, VAS, which is something yes. that we use a lot, which is a really easy way of doing self-report, right? Because yeah. it's just on a scale of like nothing to the most ever, um, you know, so how much are you craving now? So you see this, this image. So I just want to um, go on to this sort of layout of what the people's experience. So they're being measured for their emotional reactions via the galvanic skin response and the EEG. Um, they're also being measured for their food cravings. 
Yeah. And that was being done using the regulation of craving tests. So that is another validated test. Um, I, you can tell that these researchers really did their homework in making sure that things were validated, that things were standardized. Again, like we had said earlier, the pictures that they used, if you're, you're watching on YouTube, you can see the image that we're looking at. The pictures were all standardized as well. So mm -hmm. it, it, there's no, additional biases that are coming into this that they didn't account for um, mm -hmm. based on the study design. So the, there was a decision science is part of it where you're asking the person to decide, are you going to eat this picture of this food? Are you interested in eating it now or later? Um, but also the other thing they manipulated was the sound level. So was it loud? Um, and there was, you know, a very measured decibel level, or was it softer. So there was always going to be ambient music in the background throughout the entire experience. So they measured the physiological reactions and the brain reactions, and then also those craving ratings. So seeing those pictures, how much do they crave this on, on a scale? Yeah. And um, one thing I would like to mention is that this was a within subject design study. So every participant went through the, um, all the, the images. Yeah. They went through all the images. They went through the loud and the soft noise, as well as being exposed to the now or later conditions. So mm -hmm. they were asked to think about it. Um, when you're exposed to the now conditions, um, you know, would you have that cookie now? What is that taste like? What is the smell like? They were trying to get you to envision it. Yeah. Whereas that later condition, it was a little bit more of a projective exercise. Mm -hmm. And, and it was interesting because they were talking a lot about system <clears throat> one and system two, and without actually saying it, they were talking about system three, that projective yep. component. Um, well, system which, three is kind of that made up system, right? Right. Um, but that people were already doing, but you know, it is an interesting idea and a great way of, of testing things. You know, when you're doing like a, a fragrance study or a flavor study, you have people tasting things like, well, would you want more of this? It's a great question when you're trying to figure out craveability or purchase intent or, you know, how much people really like something. Yeah, absolutely. but I want to talk a little bit more about the methodologies because, you know, they are using EEG. And I think a lot of people want to use EEG, especially when you're in the space of consumer neuroscience, everybody says, oh, can we slap gear on someone's head? <laughs> yes, you can. Um, but right. Um, and the, the measures that people use most, most often are the ones that they're measuring here, um, which is easy to do because you can buy a relatively inexpensive headset mid-range headset, right? That's good for this sort of purpose as opposed to more academic clinical purposes. Um, but you can use something like the iMotion software to get pretty easy output. So you don't have to do a lot of the hard math that goes into understanding all of this electrical impulses that are coming out. And so one of the measures is uh, frontal alpha asymmetry. And I like debating this a little bit because it is a little bit of a confusing topic, right? So a lot of issues come in when you start talking about frontal alpha asymmetry, when you're talking about the brain, you're talking about asymmetry, then you get into that sort of like, I guess, mythology that people are always interested in saying, are you a right brain person or a left brain yeah. person? Like just brain asymmetry in general, are there asymmetries in the brain? Yes. Right. So for example, I think it's that the right frontal is actually larger than the left frontal, whereas, you know, the left occipital is larger than the right occipital. You have some areas of the brain that are specialized on one side that are different than the other. Um, and when people use something like EEG, they notice certain patterns when they did different sort of foundational basic science studies. And Davidson is one of the ones everybody quotes all the time from the 90s, who did some of that foundational EEG work, where he saw differences with um, frontal right and left asymmetry. So alpha in particular. And so I thought it'd be interesting to touch on a couple of things about what those words mean. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about frontal asymmetry, it's not entirely straightforward as just left activity versus right activity but you're taking like the natural log and subtracting. So it's really a ratio, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's also important to mention here that the FA is also referred to as frontal lateralization, which makes sense when you're thinking about it in terms of a ratio, because it's like you said, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of comparing things and you're doing this using the power spectral density. And so that in itself is looking at signal distributions of power over frequency. And yeah. so when you're considering yeah. things like that, it makes much more sense that it's a ratio. 
And also importantly, we're talking about alpha. So it's not general activity. It's not all activity in the frontal areas of the brain, but specifically alpha waves, because there are different types of wave patterns and electrical activity that you can see in the brain. Um, and alpha is kind of an interesting one to focus on because people, when they talk about generalized alpha brainwave activity, they're talking about things like sort of like rest and meditation. So after you do something intense and you sit down, um, you will see an increase in alpha activity. Am I right? Yeah. Yep. And they are more of that slower wave that's going on. So when you're talking about brain waves, you're talking about the frequency of the bumps in the, the graph, right? And then also the amplitude. So the interesting thing about alpha waves is that they're slower. So they have a slower frequency, but they have a higher amplitude. And that's how you identify them is by the shape of that graph. So again, when we think about what we're measuring here, we're looking at that frontal alpha asymmetry. Um, and it's supposed to be an indication of specifically motivation. And that's yeah. where I think it gets tricky, right? Because yeah. what does motivation even mean? Especially we're looking at a study that's talking about food craving, right? And I think when people think motivation, they're thinking like your propensity to do something, to take action. Yeah. And I do think they specify in the paper that they try to refer to the frontal asymmetry as not just engagement, but they were trying to also include in their engagement rewards incentives to kind yeah. of all fit into this mold. But it gets but very it does, complicated when you do that. It is. Yeah. It's very complicated because the idea of motivation in itself is complicated. Yeah. You're, you might be motivated by different things for for different contexts, different situations. For example, mm -hmm. I am a um, self-proclaimed hangry person. So I am very motivated by, like, <laughs> if I'm hungry, I'm motivated to get myself some food. Whereas other people that may be practicing uh, certain dietary restrictions, such as, um, um, I forget what it's called when you do the 12 hours a day of fasting. Intermittent uh, fasting. Yes, intermittent yeah. fasting. They might have a different, um, different thresholds in, in yeah. food cravings. And that's something to keep in mind. That That is really important. But also I think a lot of times when people talk about emotion and frontal asymmetry, they assume it's positive and negative, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that is really difficult because in motivation, what they're actually what the basis of it is, is about approach withdrawal, right? Yeah. So are you more likely to approach something or are you more likely to withdraw from something? And something can be a negative experience that you still approach. Um, for example, the difference between fear and anger is that in fear, both negative, in fear, you're withdrawing and in anger, you're approaching. So I think it's really important to keep that sort of perspective in mind because I think a lot of times, particularly in industry, when they're using EEG and frontal asymmetry, they kind of overgeneralize the FAA into being a positive versus negative experience, right? Yeah. And I do think that it's important to recognize that that positive frontal asymmetry that they were talking about, having that score in the paper, they recognized that they defined it as um, when it is a positive frontal asymmetry, that the, there is the emotional um, motivation and approach to it. Whereas the opposite is true. So if you have a great, a greater, they say the left frontal he uh, hemisphere alpha power that you're going to then have that avoidance and withdrawal behavior. And so they specify that that is how they're defining it within this context, but it could be different depending on what EEG studies you're looking at. Absolutely. Which is what makes it so complicated, I think. Um, so I think this is a good design, but you know, it, it is so easy to, in a slippery slope to go in the way of over-interpreting data or misinterpreting data. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. And the other thing that they looked at was cognitive load. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because they brought up how with cognitive load, they only were looking at the frontal part of the brain because they were, again, just considering that power spectral density. And mm -hmm. I find that very interesting because um, the cognitive load, if you do a little bit of background research into it, um, it's linked to both the alpha waves and the theta waves, which are involved in both the frontal and parietal sides of the brain and brain regions. So I, it felt like in that moment, I, I questioned a little bit of why they decided yeah. to do that. And, um, 
they, from, from what they wrote in their limitations, at least they said that, um, for the, the lengths of the study, it, it wasn't worth it for them to go and explore, but I do sure. think it, it would have been useful to, if, if it was collected to have had that available as a supplementary, uh, bit of material for people to, to take a look at. Absolutely. So that's what they did. And I think the question is, what did they find? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so they did find differences, um, you know, in the, the craving and, you know, all these different measures that also was reflected in the EEG. Um, you know, so here is a representation again of what we were just talking about with the frontal alpha asymmetry and the different uh, brain waves that they were looking at: theta waves, alpha waves, beta waves. So this is just a schematic uh, of what that looks like for those of you that can see it. Um, for those of you who can't, it, this isn't really the results; it's just sort of a schematic of what um, brain activity would look like. Um, but when we look at the results and we we hear we read what they talked about, um, they did see differences for the different decision perspectives, right? Whether or not it's something that they would eat now or whether they, it's something they would eat later. Yes. And I want to mention, I know we, we might've skipped, uh, we might've touched on a little bit, but I want to just say explicitly what the, their hypothesis was. Um, and before we go into the results, so they hypothesized that both the noise levels and the decision perspective would affect subjective food cra cravings, as well as objective measures, including what we had just chatted about EEG and EDA, um, for the emotional arousal motivations and cognitive load. So that was their, uh, what they, what they hypothesized and what they expected. And for the most part, they did find what they hypothesized. Right. Um, I mean, there was the increase in alpha um, activity, right? Yes. The frontal asymmetry with, there was an increase with loud. Yeah. Right. Um, there was also an increase. Um, and this was actually across not just the alpha, but also the beta and the theta, right? Mm -hmm. So activity in general goes up <laughs> when you have a louder environment. Now Which also, <laughs> um, GSR or physiological arousal, the EDA that also went up when the environment was louder and, you know, simple finding, simple first finding to way to talk about it because, and, and it's one of those, okay, so what, because as, as Catherine was just kind of joking, because water is wet, right? Yes. When, when the environment is louder and noisier, um, your brain is dealing with more information and, and it's going to be more active. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, one other thing I do want to bring up before we go too far into the results was that, um, there were certain things about the participants that I wanted to touch on that I think could be mentioned because it wasn't in the limitations, but it's things that we try to keep in mind as we run EEG studies that I think is important to discuss. Um, for example, they, they mentioned that they recruited 37 people, um, but ended up Students. dropping one person. I'm sorry. Students, students. Yep. It's exactly. always good to remem remember that they're students. Yes. It was 37 <laughs> students. One was dropped because of their data. So it was 36 students of the ages of 18 to 35, but they, um, they did a gender split, which I thought was a very interesting choice. So they split it 50% women, 50% men. Um, and they did mention that they didn't, um, they asked people not to drink alcohol 24 hours prior. Uh, and they asked them not to eat any food two hours prior, but there was no mention of caffeine. And I think that that is something to keep in mind is that that is something that should be controlled for when doing yeah. an EEG study. Um, another thing that was left out was the idea of handedness. So, uh, traditionally you, you tend to recruit people that are right-handed, um, especially just, when you're looking at asymmetry. Yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, so I, I, it was just a couple of things that I made note of. I, I it was funny with the alcohol one because it makes sense with students that you would, uh, you, you have that as top of mind, <laughs> um, but it's also important to remember again, that, you know, that they are students. And so when you ask them to do things like refrain from alcohol and you invite them into a study where you're paying them, or perhaps it's part of course participation that they have to participate in some sort of study, then you have a higher motivation to lie about such things right. um, or not be compliant to the rules. And so that's always something to think about. I mean, you can have that in any study, obviously, um, but, you know, there are certain groups that may be more motivated to participate in studies than others. Um, so it's always something to keep in mind. 
Absolutely. But it was interesting, even with uh, those considerations in mind that there, there, and just going back to that idea of water is wet, there, there was a lot of things shown that when you have a lot of sensory input, cognitive load was actually the highest there. And I think that's really interesting because you, uh, cognitive load was loudest, but also you are more aroused, uh, based on the EDA measures in a loud noise condition. Yes. So it's, it's all supporting that idea that when there's a lot of sensory output, you, you're activated by that. And, um, yeah. so like the question is, are you more likely to crave, um, are you more likely to crave items that are, you know, higher calorie, et cetera, because of the environment that you're in. And, you know, just this, there's, there's an image that they have, and there's a figure that they have, figure seven, in the paper, which shows a very complicated dynamic of all of the different measures that they looked at um, and the different sort of um, implications they have for their overall framework, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, the different um, amount of uh, power that each one has on the overall outcome. Uh, and it's a really interesting, it's a regression study. It's a really interesting way to look at the data. And I think everybody should really do that because one of the things when you come from academia, where you're studying food intake and you're having these conversations about feeding behavior, um, there is an image that everybody uses about all the inputs that influence your decision to choose different foods. Interesting. That there's social inputs, there's physiological inputs, and there's, you know, all these sort of hormonal inputs, neurotransmitters, and you can list out all these different ones, all the different hormones, all the different neurotransmitters, your personal history, you know, what are the food types that you're being exposed to? What was the last thing you ate? Like all these things really influence your feeding decisions. And so seeing this uh, framework reminded me of that, you know, like total, like, you know, flashback sort of situation, like, ah, um, but <laughs> it's interesting to see like the weight that different things might have because they all have an impact on your overall, uh, ratings, your food yeah. cravings, how much you would want to eat that, that picture of that food. Um, and it, it is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's one piece of the puzzle. You know, it's, it's one slice of the cake if we want to stay with the, the food theme. Um, but it is, yeah, I think that there, this goes back to the idea of really trying to figure out where in context does this fit in the overall picture of someone's decision-making. So right. it, it serves a place. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it kind of, again, that water is what's her idea. We do understand that cues around us, context and cues and stimuli, all these things drive behavior. You know, you have these internal workings that are ultimately having to weigh these different inputs and all this, you know, sensory information that's coming in, both from your body, as well as the environment around you. And that helps shape the decisions you decide to make in order to sustain your body, you know, to eat the food that you need to survive. You know, do you have to eat it now? Do you have to eat it later? How much do you want it? You know, how hard are you willing to work to get that food? Um, and so I think it is really important to look at this sort of stuff. It's also important to look at, you know, any of the, the possible intervening factors that are going on, like Catherine was bringing up, but it's an interesting look and an interesting study, an interesting paradigm. Yes, absolutely. And so overall from their findings, they, they concluded that their hypothesis was generally correct, that both noise level and decision perspective was influenced by subjective food cravings and objective measures. So they, they were able to find what they sought, sought out to find. Mm -hmm. However, um, there are a couple caveats that I, I do appreciate that they mentioned in their limitations, um, that, like, like Michelle was kind of alluding to before are important to make note of because no study's perfect. Everyone, you know, everyone knows that, but, um, what they have here is a really strong design. And if we can take from this design and then, you know, implement it into future research, I think that we could build off of it. And yeah. that's how science works, you know, <laughs> particularly. Yeah. Looking at things like the ROC that they did. Right. Yeah. Um, I think taking, you know, ideas from basic psychological research and the way they transform that to apply to this situation is, is very valuable. And, you know, something that we always talk about, you know, utilizing methodologies from multiple different sources in order to better understand, especially when you're talking about something as complicated as human decision-making, um, better understand how people are being driven. 
Absolutely. So with that being said, I don't want to end without playing our game. Um, so I have some questions here, Michelle, are you ready to do a fun little rapid fire? Sure. Free association. Okay, great. <laughs> so we're going to get started with that. Now the first okay. word I have for you donut. Yum. <laughs> That's what would be mine too. <laughs> Brain. Smart. Restaurants. Full. Chocolate. Tasty. Cognitive load. Heavy. Healthy food. Yum. <laughs> System one. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> Music. Loud. Cross-modal studies. Complicated. And the final one I have for you, David Bowie. <laughs> the best. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know, Michelle is a big David Bowie fan. And I felt like it was appropriate with music <laughs> since we were talking about noise. You got me there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. no, that was an interesting one. That was fun. And I hope everybody... Um, you know, enjoyed this and it encourages you to look at more research. You know, it, it's so easy to do now. You have access to something like Google Scholar. Yeah. So you can go to Google Scholar and type in some topic you like and find some academic research out there. And it'll be really interesting to read over it. And maybe you won't understand everything and that's okay. Yeah, Easy way to absolutely. read studies is to read the abstract first, which is the, you know, brief, you know, paragraph long thing at the top and uh, read the intro and read the conclusion. And if you're daring, you go in a little bit further, look at the methods and look at the statistics that they did in the results and look at the pictures and figures that they provide. But, you know, look at that intro, look at the conclusion and see if it provides you with some something you can learn from. Absolutely. And we will try to have the article linked with everything in the show notes. So that way everyone can have access to it. Um, and we just hope that you enjoyed this. Please, again, if you're interested, comment down below, rate, review, subscribe, all of those good things. And uh, we appreciate you listening until next time. Yep. Thank you. HCD Mindset is produced by Helen Ross. For more information or updates, follow HCD Research on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at HCD Research Inc. and at HCD Neuroscience. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to rate, review, and follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you and stay tuned for more curious conversations.